questions from the Moravian Institute. Um, I'm going to turn it over in about 10 seconds to, to Bob Young, but before I do that, I want to just run through very quickly what, we're, uh, what our sort of overall plan is for the morning. Uh, as I said, we're, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Young, who I think probably all of you know from our mayor of Augusta. Um, we have a few uh, brief uh, talks planned, and then we're going to open it up for the bulk of the session to really just have some discussion. So we'll be hearing uh, from Mayor Ron Wilson, Mayor Ted Ibbett. Uh, then we will be hearing from David Rushford, the director of Front River Partnership, and from Professor Michael Curley uh, from George Washington University School of Business. And I will certainly go a little bit more into their introduction uh, as they get started. Then we're going to turn it over to Cameron Amley, um, who will be facilitating what we hope will be a really interactive discussion among everyone here in the room. We're here to get your thoughts and, and share ideas among the group, so um, we certainly don't want this to be a, a session where we're talking about you. So with that, I'm just going to go into this talk. Actually, let me just say one more thing about before you get started. As we get into the discussion, um, we are recording this session so that the other conservation leadership council members um, can get the benefit of hearing your ideas. So we'll be walking around with microphones and um, cameras will help us make sure that we're getting everything. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, for those of you from out of town, welcome to Augusta. We're glad you're here with us today, and uh, certainly for the uh, partnership, we're glad the Conservation Leadership Partnership has chosen Augusta and this beautiful campus here at Augusta State University uh, to hold this important roundtable this morning. Uh, those of you who are sitting uh, on the back bench, if you'd like to come up to a table at any point, please feel free to come up and make yourself at home. Uh, first of all, the uh, partnership. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we're all about. Uh, the partnership is a new initiative that is focused on innovative and practical solutions to environmental challenges. Uh, solutions that are informed by concepts of fiscal discipline, limited government, market entrepreneurship, and personal accountability. And those of us involved in the partnership are former government executives, ranchers, representatives, hunting and, and fishing organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations, and others. Uh, today we're going to focus on water quality and public policy. Uh, we're going to touch on municipal infrastructure, agriculture, and then financing new projects uh, during our meeting today. And of course, this is a roundtable, so if there are other topics that you want to engage in and bring up during the roundtable, that is certainly uh, most appropriate. Uh, our conservation leadership partner looks at things with a very wide angle uh, lens. We've commissioned papers by scholars uh, in universities and in think tanks to provide uh, innovative solutions uh, to many of the issues and to provide uh, people with on the ground experience in these issues. Uh, the issues uh, pertain to energy and water security, habitat and land conservation, local engagement, and technology innovations that enhance environmental protection. And the solutions all harness market forces and local initiatives. They sustain fiscal accountability and responsibility, and they set forth solutions with a limited government framework. Now, uh, as you heard, my colleague, uh, Karen, only will, uh, while well, she served, let me tell you this, she served as Associate Director of Environmental Policy at the White House Council for Environmental Quality. And she was also the acting Assistant Secretary of Water and Science at the Department of the Interior, and she's going to moderate our discussion after our presenters uh, finish with their presentations. Uh, the presenters are going to share their perspectives on uh, water policy, and we're encouraging you in the room to uh, engage in the discussion of these issues. We, we cast this as a roundtable because we like audience participation. We like that discussion, and we're also recording the event this morning so that we can share it with others uh, who are not here today. We do not want you to be shy. I think your perspectives and your experiences are going to be important uh, to what we're talking about uh, today. And the ideas that are generated today, we take back to the partnership. And, and we hope that this discussion will radiate outward from here at Augusta State University and spark other discussions and other conservation ideas. Our goal is to serve as a catalyst for conversations about conservation. And we think the nation not only can, but must sustain environmental health of air, water, land, and wildlife. And we think that entrepreneurial action, private stewardship, and local initiative can underpin these efforts. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I want to thank you all for coming. And we're going to let our speakers come up in order, self-introduce, and then move on with their presentation. Thank you very much.
morning. I'm Ron Littlefield. I'm the mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I am proud to be in my sister city of Augusta with uh, all of you gathered from so many different disciplines. I, I'm talking to folks from the environmental sciences, people from school here, other public officials, so you really have an interesting very appropriate gathering to be talking about the subject. Chattanooga, Tennessee is a river city, and uh, that's not unique. Many cities, most cities, were created on a waterfront of some sort because that was the channel that was utilized for commerce many years ago. So Chattanooga, like many river cities, is at the bottom of the bowl. That's important because it relates to how we deal with this issue of water quality whether it's drinking water or water that's treated, sewage and such, uh, the quality of the water is a matter that we have to deal with. Chattanooga, unlike most southern cities, is an industrial city. And it was an industrial city from right after its founding. It started as an Indian trading post on the Tennessee River, which is the fifth most significant river in the United States. So we're not hurting for water, but we have a challenge of water quality. And being an industrial city, you saw the early pictures or paintings or drawings or whatever of Chattanooga, they were always proud to show the smokestacks. And if the smoke was not coming out of the smokestack, someone felt obligated to put smoke coming out of the smokestack. You know, that meant success. And we were a very successful industrial city. Again, not like other southern cities that mostly traced their economic lineage back to agriculture. Chattanooga, Birmingham, the last few cities were industrial. As a result of that, we had a lot of air pollution problems and a lot of water pollution problems. In October of 1969, 43 years ago this month, Walter Cronkite told the world that the dirtiest city in America was Chattanooga, Tennessee. And he wasn't wrong. He was primarily talking about air pollution. But I remember, I was there. And I was a city planner by background, and I worked with communities that were downstream from Chattanooga for quite a distance from the initial outfalls of the industries of Chattanooga. There were signs along the river that said avoid human contact. We've come a long way since that time. <clears throat> That's basically where Chattanooga was. And in the 1970s, the U.S. Public Health Service was in with the Environmental Protection Agency. Created. The EPA encouraged, mandated, and financed regional plans, and Chattanooga took advantage of that. And then they proceeded to provide grants to begin to implement those plans. As a result of that, there's been quite a bit spent over the years, and uh, that total in the years that since Clean Water Act was passed over 40 years ago is a remarkable $1.67 trillion broken down by water supply and sewage. And it's surprising to many people we've spent more on water supply on total water than we have on sewage. So sewage is a more complicated, more complicated process. But of course, drinking water is the critical issue that we have to deal with most carefully. This is my favorite slide out of all these slides, and I have to give credit where credit is due. These slides came from Dr. Richard Anderson, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, since he was to be here in this place, standing here doing this presentation. Couldn't be here, and he sent them to me, so if you ask me to explain these numbers, I can't. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Anderson is a very capable uh, person in, in his field, and uh, I know he wouldn't leave me wrong, and, and, and the reason I know that this is a very accurate figure, because if you look at this chart, the, uh, the red is expenditure on water, the blue climbing towards the stratosphere there is expenditure over the years on sewer, and then the little, also another shade of red line at the bottom with the little blip in the middle of it, I remember that personally, because the city of Chattanooga was proceeding along that directed path of uh, do 
laboring plans for what we're going to do with regional water quality. And we were beginning to tap into the federal grant program just when they cut it off. And if you look there right between 1970 and 1980, that's where the little blip is. And that's where our problems began and it's where problems with most cities began. Because suddenly we knew the challenge that was before us and the federal government was no longer going to be our partner in paying for it. I guess there, there was some necessity of that because if you expected the federal government to cover all the costs of all the communities, then perhaps it was an unachievable thing. This is the important thing. In meeting our clean water guidelines, the federal authorities have set an arbitrary 2% of median household income as being a level that's reasonable. And if you look, if you consider that, say, well, 2%, that's not all that much. But then if you look at just a, a, a selection of cities, and I just have three, this being Baltimore, 2% if you're making, excuse me, Two percent, if you're making two hundred thousand dollars, is not a significant amount of your income. If you're down in the lower range, and there are families and individuals struggling to live, it's a much more demanding uh, factor out of your income. Baltimore is a fairly poor city. That's indicated by the percent of of uh, households that fall within these lower ranges. Chicopee, Massachusetts, is another poor city, smaller city. But again, the indicator is that people at the lowest ranges are paying an inordinate amount of their income just for water and sewer. Final slide, city of Lima, Ohio, and uh, another poor city, small city, and again, the effect of paying for the necessary, necessary water and sewer improvements is falling inordinately on the poor. Chad and I just went through a very lengthy and difficult process of negotiating a new federal consent order, which is the way we do business now. I've told, I've been told that many times. And I understand that, and I know that's the way we're doing business. But using the judicial system to try and achieve something that, that, that we really should be trying to achieve in science is, in my opinion, a, a misplaced way of using our resources. And uh, Chattanooga just negotiated and accepted a consent order which only requires us to pay into improvements of our system a quarter of a billion dollars over the next 15 years, $250 million. Believe me, I'm smiling because that was far less than we had anticipated. We were able to wrestle out of the process some new ways of dealing with these costs, green infrastructure and such, and we can talk about that more this morning. I think that's the sort of thing we need to be doing. We need to be talking about new flexible ways to achieve water quality. Water quality is a goal that we all endorse and we all want to see achieved. But we've said many times in this process, somewhere along the way, from the mid-1970s, when the federal government said, okay, we've helped you with your plans, we've helped you get started, now you're on your own. It became more and more a judicial question. I'm not criticizing the lawyers in the room this morning, but somehow we've lost our way, and it became a question of going to federal courts instead of using our resources and our entrepreneurial and our inventiveness as a community to deal with these problems. We need a partner and not a process. 
morning. I am uh, we're probably the outlier in this uh, conversation, uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad to be here so I can share with you a story that really does relate. And um, what the mayor just explained is the idea of incentive based versus the regulatory based system. Uh, what we do on the planet and, and what I'm going to describe to you has all been incentive based. It's been driven by a farming community that sees a future in which they, they need to use water to grow the crops that we need in the country, and they're trying to do it as efficiently as possible. And so this is something of a success story of a locally led initiative, you know, which uh, was a good deal of government support, but certainly locally led. So I, I am the director of the Flint River Basin Partnership. I'm not originally from Georgia. I'm actually um, from North Carolina primarily. I married a girl from Cambridge, Georgia, so I became a native after that. Um, the Flint River Basin Park Partnership is an agricultural water uh, conservation initiative uh, that was pioneered by the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Nature Conservancy to help farmers um, conserve water through using innovative technology. Down on the points, we're in the southwestern corner of the state. Uh, we have a lot of agriculture. Um, Georgia actually has a lot of agriculture as well, but um, in our area there's, there's, there's a whole lot. Um, and our agriculture relies on centrifugal irrigation. So you can see that there's a circle. This is a pivot circle, and that actually is the center pivot. Uh, that is irrigated. This is the Flint River, and this actually is the plantation land. So it's just to show that connection between agriculture and the aquatic system. Uh, the lower Flint and, and generally southwest Georgia, Georgia in general is, is an incredibly diverse state. Uh, southwest Georgia is home to some, some extraordinary species, uh, endangered species, but in general a uh, richness um, in, the, in, in the water environment that, that is very profound and uh, worth, worth treasuring, uh, especially for our future generations. Um, in our area, we are the we, we contribute pretty heavily to, to Georgia's ranking as the number one producer of peanut in the country, uh, number two in cotton production, and number three in sweet corn production. Uh, these crops are uh, pretty important uh, for our economy, but also uh, require water at different degrees, and so therefore we have irrigated agriculture in our, in our region. It's very significant. This is, uh, this is Martin McClendon. He's a farmer. Southwest Georgia farms uh, cotton and peanut and corn. Uh, he's also chairman of the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District. I don't tend to, to, to use him in slides very often because he doesn't like it, but um, since he's not here, I thought I could. <laughs> um, if there were one reason that um, the work that we're doing has had a, a major impact, it's through leadership like uh, Mark, uh, leaders like Mark. And, and other farmers in our area that have dedicated themselves to pursuing new ways of using water efficiently. It's one thing to have vision of, of what we need to do to sustain the landscape, but it's much more important to have a commercial scenario that can work to both bring uh, the, the, the farming community up into newer, innovative technologies, but at the same time hit that bottom line where you're actually improving the cost effect that has of agriculture. And that's why um, I think we're very successful is that we have a local leadership team of farmers and businessmen who have essentially uh, decided to adopt this technology. They put their name and their reputation behind it and, uh, and have started a bit of a trend, which um, at this point uh, has allowed us to become national leaders in this field. This is Center for Irrigation. Um, one of the tools that we use uh, to irrigate in, in Southwest Georgia. One of the innovations that, that we came up with down in Southwest Georgia was to, uh, instead of spraying the water uh, out from above the boom at very high pressure, it actually drop the water down to most of the crops. Um, this has been very popular because it allows farmers to uh, move the pivot around the circle a lot faster and save on energy costs. Energy costs are pretty significant when you're pumping large amounts of water. Um, one thing uh, that I learned uh, years ago from an NRCS uh, uh, field, field person was that uh, when you think about moving water uh, or when you think about irrigating, you need to think about moving water from below the ground to above the ground. And when you think about it that way and then across a thousand linear feet of pipe, you're, you're, you're actually moving tonnage and that requires energy. So whenever we can not turn the irrigation system on, that is the preferred scenario. Um, and so 
technology both uh, considered that what well, 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 uh, um, just a picture of, of the sprinklers. This is a low pressure system that's mimicking rainfall. Um, it, it allows us to save a significant amount of water due to a lack of evaporation and wind drain. This is the technology that uh, I wanted to really talk about today. It's called variable rate irrigation. This was born and bred in Georgia. And I think Georgia can take great pride in, in development of this technology. Um, and, and the reason is uh, basically a number of our University of Georgia researchers were looking at variable rate applications of different um, chemicals. Uh, pesticides, fertilizers, etc. And they thought to themselves, well, why couldn't we use a variable application rate of water? And when you look at southwest Georgia, you see a lot of fields, both with uh, fields that overlap in the pivots, but then also fields that have uh, this sort of different topography. So, so in this particular field, you've got a large wetland area. It doesn't matter how hard you try, you're not going to grow a crop in there. And then also, this is actually a sort of cool scenario. Uh, this is on plantation land. These are actually wildlife crossings that, that are actually built in conjunction with soil types that can't grow crops. So you have these large areas, and in this particular field, it's, it's, it's a pretty significant area that is removed from irrigation or does not need irrigation, so therefore can be removed from irrigation. And that's what variable rate irrigation does. It not only removes these areas from irrigation using GPS mapping, but it also um, allows you to change the rates of water in the different areas of the field so that you can only apply what's needed. In this particular field in a dry year, you're saving close to 35 million gallons of water just by shutting water off of these non-crop areas. When you take that number and you begin to, 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 to build it out within a constant and average, and you, you put in about 70 systems in Georgia, you're looking at 17% water savings per uh, which, which, which has a value which does add up and which does begin to meet our goal of offsetting water use with the um, environmental impacts in our, in, our, in our watershed. This was the very first um, variable rain irrigation system built in 2000. Um, as you can see, uh, these are all the different panels. This was at the UGA research station. This, on this side is the 2005 version. Uh, the district and, and the Nature Conservancy came together with NRCS to deploy the first 22 VRI systems in the country. Actually had to go to Australia to an engineering firm in Australia to essentially um, design and build, build technology. Um, and, and the first 22 systems were, were very good systems, but uh, the technology has improved dramatically. This is the most recent iteration, 2012. So what you can see here, and, and this is the point of hoping to make to this, to this particular audience is you've got massive change in the technology, a streamlining of the technology, a reduction in cost of the technology over many years, primarily because we've been able to get the technology out on the working farm and get feedback from the farmers, have the research team there support it, and build this, um, this, this new iteration. Down here actually is, um, is the rate map. You can see that there. Um, that, that is used to define the irrigation pattern. This is a team from Coca-Cola, global water resources managers um, from around the world that came down to learn about variable rate irrigation technology. Coca-Cola has helped us um, fund some of our work. Uh, we're also working with the IBM Corporation to um, learn more about how we can further advance the technology. To, to put VRI in perspective, um, and, and I like to tell the story now, Probably won't have much time left. But um, when I was a young man, I was 16, uh, I, I wanted to have the best car stereo out there. And it was just really important to me. But at that time, the only thing you had really going for you was a cassette deck. Um, and the sound quality of the cassette deck wasn't quite as good as the CD player. But I bought this really nice one, so I had an input in the back of my uh, area where I could put my CD player. So I would drive down the road to my portable CD player on my lap listen to the music, and, and I'm just really happy with myself. Um, why I tell you this is that at a certain point in time, a CD player in a car was an option. Variable rate irrigation is an option now. Uh, what we developed down in Georgia, and has been deployed in Georgia uh, more than anywhere else in the, in, in, in the world, is now being deployed throughout the world to the two largest irrigation manufacturers in the world, Valley, Valley, 
Vermont and dramatic lynching. Uh, what that means is that anywhere in the world now, because of what we did in Georgia, because of this, this locally led partnership, anywhere in the world, when someone puts in a center pivot irrigation system right outside of Augusta here, they will have the option, maybe expensive right now, but they will have the option to only put water where it needs to be put. I consider that a little bit of a revolution within the irrigated agriculture industry. I think that uh, the, the implications of it will be seen in the billions of gallons of water that we save across the earth at some point. There are 250,000 of these systems uh, operating uh, across the globe, and if there are areas where they don't need to be watered, we can now shut them off. So that's the type of innovation that I think is very important. It's built by a partnership um, within the uh, within a locally led group called the Flint River Soil Water Conservation District, a national environmental organization, the Nature Conservancy, as well as NRCS, USDA. And I know that this may be a more conservative audience, but USDA is an incredible asset to farming communities in this country. The resources that they provide, technical expertise, I, I cannot tell you how wonderful this is for me working within the context of allocation. They are great. And uh, they invested in this technology early on, gave us the seed money to try it, and since then we've had a whole lot more farmers getting engaged. Um, the last thing I'll show you, I think I'm running out of time. Yeah. Yes, I'm already out of time. No, you're not doing it. Okay. Um, remote soil moisture monitoring. This allows us to put probes in the ground to know exactly when to irrigate. So it's one thing to remove all the areas of, uh, of land that don't need irrigation from irrigation. It's another thing to only irrigate when the crop needs it. We have scientists, researchers, we have crop models that are extraordinarily advanced. And what we're doing right now is we're building, within the context of, of, of the University of Georgia and IBM, we're building a new iteration of this. So it's cost effective, it's cheap. The original ones, these were funded by Coca-Cola, cost about $5,000 per year. Now we're in a, a UGA-driven uh, uh, type of system that needs to be commercialized. Um, that is $3,500 uh, for, 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 for 20 of the probes instead of just one. So, so we're constantly, the reason that I want to stress the farmer leadership in our organization is they're constantly pushing us to make conservation viable within the, within the economic structure of agriculture. They also believe very firmly that as we're looking at water issues across the state and across the nation, um, you know, the, the, the people need to see water as a public good and therefore support these types of efforts so that we can use only the water we need. This is uh, that same probe with field high corn. This is the type of graph that you see. Um, if I'm successful or we're successful at what we're doing, eventually everything will be through an app. You'll be able to see when you're supposed to irrigate, how much you're supposed to irrigate, and hypothetically, if, if a grant goes through, We'll even have weather prediction models built by IBM to tell us when it's going to rain. Um, obviously, there's some skepticism there, but um, but it is IBM. And one thing I've learned about them, they are good at what they do. Finally, I just want to re-emphasize NRCS. This is uh, Chief Dave White, the head of the National Resource and Conservation Service. This is one of our local farmers. At the end of the day, our USDA has a responsibility to maintain our, our ability to grow the crops we need. It's a, it's a security issue for us to be able to grow the crops we need in this country. And USDA helps our farmers both do that, but in addition to, to, to adopt some of these newer conservation practices. It's this dialogue right here between the local farmer and, and, and the federal government that really allows for that type of exchange to occur. And in the result being um, really what has become uh, one of the largest programs of this type of nation and has led to uh, billions of gallons of water uh, conserved every year. Um, actually, a couple years ago, I think we've surpassed it now, but a couple years ago we used the city of Augusta as our marker. And we had saved as much water in the lower Flint River Basin as the people of the city of Augusta uh, used it over the course of the year. And so uh, I think we're beyond that now, but, but still. We're not anywhere near the end yet. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for your time, and, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Yes, I think I got it. Kate, 
how does this work with the camera if I move around? Yeah, good, okay. Um, so this is, I wish David had spoken last because I always like to leave things on an upbeat note. And that was certainly an optimistic message that we gave. Uh, the mayor alluded to a couple of problems, which is to say environmental improvement by judicial fiat, which is just crazy. And he also discussed the problems of affordability. And if that sort of left a bad taste in your mouth, or at least not a bad taste in your mouth, but at least sort of a bad taste in your mouth, wait till you hear what I've got to say. Now, uh, I'm a lawyer by trade. For which I ask for forgiveness. Um, and I went. And I worked for the state of New York, and uh, we had a bank uh, that was going into a state-owned bank for economic development, going into bankruptcy. And the governor sent me over there to fix it. And I said, I don't, don't know anything about banking. And he said, Well, you're going to learn the value of OJT. And so on-the-job training is what it did. And I've been in finance ever since then. And I'm the only person I know of in the world that describes the field as environmental. Which I think is emblematic of why we're in some of the problems I'm just going to show you here. Um, there you go. I live north of Baltimore, but I get my water from the city of Baltimore. Just look at those numbers. What a disgrace. The national average is, is according to the studies that have been done by the American Water Workers Association, for water and wastewater on a national basis is 1.5% uh, of median household income. In the United States, median household income is right at $50,000. So that's $750. And if you figure half of water and half of sewer, which is actually a little bit more for water. Uh, but that's what I should be paying. And the reason I should be paying that is because, as you can see, it's almost $300 more if I were paying the national average. It's so that my extra $300 goes to people that can't afford the 83 to begin with. And that's where we need to go. That's what one of the things that's tragically wrong with subsidies. And here's, here's where the disease is. There's a, the marvelous, as you saw on the mayor's slide about the federal program, in 1987 they amended the Clean Water Act and started a loan program. And this is what comes from that. If you look at the top line up there, if you went to the bond market, which all cities and counties and everything does to finance most of the stuff that they do, and you get a 20 year loan at 4%, you pay on a million dollars. This is all based on a per million, right? You pay $73,000. Um, let me tell you that this clean water program can only make 20, 20 year loans, which is one of the serious flaws. Now, what they do, because it's a federal program and because there are so many federal requirements, is they can't, nobody in their right mind would take a federal, would take a loan from these people. If they could issue a bond, because the bonds are just much simpler. I have in my computer, which I haven't been able to deal with yet, uh, some information from the guys in New Hampshire that run this program that said that the city of Durham, New Hampshire, walked away from a, a significant, an eight figure loan because of one of the federal requirements that they pay higher wages. That's called Davis Bacon wages, which are prevailing wages, much higher than, than, than normal. And because of that requirement, the project costs went up by 20%. And it was then cheaper to use a bond. Then look at that. This is number two a subsidized loan program. The subsidized, instead of paying 73000 per million, you're paying 61000 per million because they cut the rate in half. And this is the national trend for this program. If the, if the market rate, if you can sell a bond for 4%, you can go to the state SRS, the state revolving fund program. And get the money for half that rate, which is two percent. Now let me just tell you this, and this goes back to the question of affordability. For those of you who are from DC or at least know the DC area, Loudoun County and Fairfax County are two of the northern Virginia communities right around Washington DC. They have median household income levels of over a hundred thousand dollars. Median, which means half the people are more than that. In uh, my state, Maryland, Howard County has $101,000 median household income. Now let me tell you, all three of those counties get subsidies. This is nuts. This is totally nuts. This is the difference between general subsidies and targeted subsidies. Targeted subsidies are you take Michael, you charge Michael Curley $375 a year for his water, and you take $300 and put it in the account of poor people who can't pay for their water. General subsidies are these dumb things where the people in Howard County and Loudoun County and Fairfax County with incomes of over $100,000 get their subsidized water bill. Now, how do you fix all this? What you 
need to do is you need, as, as I told you before, the Clean Water Act has got a 20 year limit in it, the federal law, for no good reason whatsoever. Okay? Let me just tell you the Department of Agriculture, just you've heard David saying good things about I agree with you 100%. The Department of Agriculture makes loans to rural water systems and wastewater systems for 40 year terms. Okay? So why do you have a 20 year term? It's just political nonsense. It's just rubbish. It should be changed. But anyways, an unsubsidized 30 year loan, unsubsidized, right, where we're saving the money and then maybe using it to target subsidies to poor people. Look at the difference. It's about 200 bucks out of a million. See where I'm going with this? And most of the SRF charge a fee, which is about 3,000 bucks. So the subsidized program costs more than the unsubsidized program if you lengthen the term. And we've got to go with it. Now, I know a lot of folks say, well, yeah, that means you pay 10 years more. Listen, if you're buying a home, you want to pay it off fast. Or if you're buying a car, you want to pay it off fast. But in public life, you don't want to do that. School buses last 10 years. You don't want to pay a school bus off in five years because the people that are paying for it this year are paying more than they should, and the people from year 6 through 10 aren't paying it a thing, and they should. It's called intergenerational fairness, and it's one of the key principles environmental finance and all types of public works finance. So anyway, this is, that's where you need to go. Now, how do you get there? Because the Clean Water Act will only allow direct loans for 20 years, you go and guarantee which the Clean Water Act permits. Now, look at this. This is a slide that I, uh, I use to teach school. And I compare grants, subsidized loans, market rate loans, and guarantees. I wish the graduate students had done this for me to have done this in an order, but that's what it is. Okay, so this is the game we play. And the game is that you run a wastewater utility or a water utility, and the government gives you $100 million. And you, you make projects that are $5 million each. So you make, if you're giving grants, you make 20 projects. Okay? And at the end, if you're make, doing grants, at the end of the 20 projects, you're done. You pack your, pack your bags and go home. You have nothing left to do. Now look up here where it's subsidized loans. Subsidized loans in this game uh, have 0% interest. 0% interest, people have gotten away from that. There's only one state left in the union, which is Vermont, that charges 0% interest. Now last year the rate of inflation was over 3%, so that means that the Vermont program lost 3% of its value last year because they don't charge any interest. Is that smart? No, it isn't. Okay. So anyways, there's the to total. Now, the market rate loans in this game, they get 10% interest on their loan. Okay? Oftentimes, today's world is completely the game. So to, to illustrate the power of these various devices. And then loan guarantees. Loan guarantees are on the bottom. Okay? And as you can see, look at the way those numbers march across the page. Look at the difference between grants and loan guarantees. At the end of 10 years, you will be able to do 543. $5 million projects, that's two and a half billion dollars that you have been able to do, that you have been able to, two and a half billion dollars worth of, of water cleanup that you have been able to do with the hundred million that you got. Not a penny more. So this is the power of guarantee, and which is why systems, we need to move in this direction. We need to move in the direction of loan guarantees, and as you can see, for loan guarantees, we get rid of the general subsidy, and we go to target to the people who really need it. But the foolishness about uh, subsidizing uh, homeowners in Howard County on a general basis uh, who earn more than $100,000 a year is a type of insanity. We can't afford it anymore. We've got poor people in those cities that the mayor showed us that really need help. And why are we wasting our, our subsidies on, on these general subsidies of people that don't need it? Uh, how did I get there? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, this way. i got to go this way, don't I? Yeah. To say that I'm technologically challenged is an understatement. Okay, here's the, this, is the, this is my favorite slide in the world. If I only had one to show you, this is what I would show you. Because this is the graphic representation of what I just showed you. Okay? There's four little grants down there. They all give you only make it in one year, and then, you, then your program's over. And then there's the little red line is the subsidized loans, the blue line is the market rate loans, and look at the guarantee. And the real, the, 
power of that is that it's like the power of insurance. You know, if you have one car and you don't have insurance, how much should you reserve in case that car gets into an accident? The price of the car. Okay? But if you're an insurance company that insures a million cars, how much do you reserve? You probably you, you, your actuary can tell you exactly how many cars get destroyed in the United States. And let's say it's 0.8 percent a year or something like that. So you reserve like twice that, or three times that if you want to be conservative. So maybe two or three percent of what you reserve, but you don't reserve 100 percent of everything. And so that's how guarantees work. Is that not when you're guaranteeing a loan, not all of them are going to go bad. So you don't have to use you, you get a lot more leverage on that money. Uh, so. I guess so. How are we doing on time, Jim? Oh, John, I can tell a lot of I can tell a bunch of funny stories. Uh, so, anyway, the message to here that we, we need to move in the direction of is we need to move in the direction of guarantee and not loans. And certainly not these Trump based loans that, that are that have these abnormally uh, short term. Um, if you stop and think about it, for those of you who own homes, you know, if, if you, if, when you went to buy the home, if you look at the difference between a 15 and a 30 year mortgage, you know what I'm talking about. You can, or uh, if, you, if you can afford, let's say, $1,000 a month payment on a home, and the bank will give you a 30 year mortgage, you can get 45% more housing. The, the numbers are 45%. Um, let me just tell you that the state of Maryland has one of the, the state of Maryland, you know, Government, so you know, people do things beautifully, and then they do, and then turn around and do something totally crazy. Um, Maryland created what is called the Bay Restoration Fee, which the press calls the plus tax, because it's a tax uh, on every, it's a tax on everybody that's connected to a sewer system or has a septic tank, and that's of course everybody in the state. Right? So they call it plus tax. And um, the really smart thing they did is. Um, the reason they put this in the two, two really smart things that they Governor Bob Earl back in uh, 2004. Uh, Maryland needed to go, because of the Tennessee Day and sensitivity to other, they needed to go to what's called enhanced nutrient removal, which is a misband system of uh, wastewater treatment. And Bob realized that you know, although there's 260 some plants in Maryland, these people aren't going to do this on their own. We got to do it. And so instead of just saying that you have to go to this ENR system, what he did is they passed, he and the legislature passed this, the flesh tax, and they collected all the money, and now they give it back in the form of grants. So you have, if you're a citizen of Maryland, you have the pleasure of knowing that the, the, that the money that you're getting for the enhanced nutrient removal is your own. The state collects it, and then they give it right back to the grant. It's sort of a dumb system. But the beautiful part of this is, is that instead of throwing the money at projects, they use the, the tax collection to keep their dedicated to the repayment of bonds. Okay? So think of your payment. Uh, well, think of the numbers that I just showed you up on the, on the, on the earlier slide. That if you pay sixty some thousand dollars a year, you can do a million dollars worth of projects. That's what we're talking about. Is the, the flush tax now brings in about a hundred million dollars a year. And with that hundred million, they can pay off, they can pay off a billion dollars worth of bonds. So this is a really smart way to do things. In other words, creating, if you have to pass a tax statute, at least make it a dedicated tax statute so that you don't have a hundred million, a hundred million, a hundred million, a hundred million just to throw around, but you, you put it into a dedicated fund and you issue a billion dollars worth of bonds and get on with it because it's cleaning up the bank. That's a smart way of doing it. Now here's the film I the Constitution of Maryland limits the tax pledge to 15 years. That's like saying that you can't get more than a 15 year mortgage on your home, which means that your home can be 45% smaller than what you'd like to be if you get a 30 year mortgage. And in terms of the bay cleanup, for the same $100 million that they're taking out of my pocket and every other citizen of Maryland, for the flood tax, they can issue a billion, $450 million worth of tax and get $450 million more bay cleanup without another penny out of my pocket. 30 years ago. The Constitution says 15 years, they can't do it. But I don't know how, how. We all, I always talk about those crazy spendthrift people down in Virginia. We all, you know, Maryland's a political state. Virginia's one of the most conservative states. It's certainly not easy to people, right? Virginia has a 30-year statute. Those crazy nuts 
I need that when I enter the water that they have on that land. And so that's one trajectory where you have this auction that produces fire. Uh, I always looked at 34, 35, 50 million dollars. Well, why can't we get our farmers uh, to be the best in the field of irrigation? What if they had all the technology and resources they needed to only water when they needed water? Because if you do that across the scale of, 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 of 650,000 acres, uh, irrigated acres, 6,500 pivots, uh, a little bit in each pivot, a little bit of technology that is becoming very advanced in, and the farmers are adopting it much more advanced than they can be in this phase, then I think that we could offset our ultimate goal is that the issue in draft. And so my hope would be that the state would see a potential benefit in, in helping farmers to adopt these practices at their much larger scale um, within our basin, but then anywhere else in, in, in the state that has similar issues. I just want to add one last thing, and it's just because you mentioned dairy. Um, one of the really cool applications of variable rate irrigation technology is on dairy. So when you're able to look at fields and look at the different soil types, what you're able to do is understand where you can apply dairy rate through a pivot irrigation system in such a way where there's not a leaching or a impact in the watershed. If you're in dairy and you water escapes your field into a sensitive watershed, it's fine from what I understand from the EPA perspective, but quite economical. And so variable rate irrigation has been areas in Georgia to essentially keep the water within the field boundary so that you can offset that cost to the farmer. At the end of the day, what we do in Lewisburg is we're taking the incredible technology that we all use every day and where we're bringing it in the agricultural setting. Farmers are not the farmers that you used to know. And actually, I know a lot of family farmers, even though out west and more corporate, they use equipment that is so advanced now that it, that, that literally, I could give an entire hour speech about all the different things in there. You know, auto steer tractors down to a sub inch of accuracy, uh, the sprayers that are able to measure the quality of the plant as it passes over to adjust the spray amount. How work is that? Uh, it, it's just a, it's, it's a new world in agriculture, just like all of our industries. And, um, and that's what I, I get excited about. Again, going back to the concept of time conservation and of the economics of creation of land, land um, New York City uh, was proactive. I don't know what that they were as far as uh, preserving some conservation easements of uh, the past hill and the water source. Um, Buford Jasper Water County, which is uh, located downstream from Savannah, is, uh, I think, they did their first purchase of a conservation easement upstream of their intake to help protect their. Uh, Water supply. Uh, realizing that uh, additional treatment is needed as the water comes down uh, in certain states. Does Chattanooga look at anything like that or where any other cities in Tennessee look at that? Well, of course, we're in Tennessee Valley, and Tennessee Valley is part of the sort of a leader in all of that kind of planning years ago and that carried forward to today. And uh, Chattanooga, yes, we, we have been acquiring these in the West. Um, the, uh, the, the real problem that I have with that, I can't get to this morning, is that in implementing some of our plans to achieve clean water by using the port primarily, we end up with a fixed system that's been difficult to amend and that has not been changed. And until quite recently, we're all talking about the technology for green infrastructure now, as well as green water. Until very recently, like in the last five years, EPA discouraged that. <coughs> and then the city of Philadelphia. 
reopen these issues and negotiate about this more reasonable as time changes and technology changes, it is very, very difficult.
I would like to say that it would have come about just naturally over time. It probably would have. Um, many years the technology was cheaper. But at the same time, the, the, these investments through things like uh, an RCS Conservation Innovation Grant, they're going to help us. They're helping us build this connection to IDF. And IDF's specific interest is how do we build a model that can be exported across the country and across the globe. And they've chosen to a certain degree, they will be hosting their head of agriculture next week or two weeks. Uh, they may have, through, through some scenarios, chosen the plan as a pilot project. And then the pilot project is so critical because it's an opportunity to see, to hit those points, the stress points. So we have an idea. Um, the idea is viable within a technology setting, but does it work in a farming setting? Right now, farmers. Driving three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars in tractors. Tractors they can do it. The problem is, and the reason we went to IBM is that that tractor has proprietary code. The remote soil moisture monitoring has proprietary code. The variable radio irrigation has proprietary code. There was actually a meeting about municipal waterworks in Washington D.C. an idea that done for them. That I realized, wait a minute, IBM, a company like IBM, can break through. And can say no. We're ready to, to make this happen. So, and, and, and actually, uh, maybe I should sit on camera. But I did learn that uh, that they have significant influence in breaking down barriers in barriers that we have never gotten to before. They can they can do it with phone calls. So, so these big companies are going to want to engage. But right now, we really need sort of stimulus. The scenario in which we are helping with innovation, fostering.
doctors saying, hey, I'm going to put the RMI system to see if it works. And I'm going to, I'm going to go out and invest in this new technology and see if it works so that we can share it. Green room. 
just wondering, you know, why, why you go to Miami? You know, you fly over all that. Well, I mean, I'd be wonderful to see the trees on every tree. I actually built my car for it, so I can have something to say one day. I look forward to it. I don't pretend that it's cheap. Uh, but but uh, what if you just painted all the roots white in an urban, in an urban area? What if it was just a paint job? Not, not that that would solve all the problems, but I think it really comes. I have read something in the Chicago context where they have the energy build energy prices come down because of the massive tree plantings and the thoroughfares and everything that's on, 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 on the top. So I think there is potential there. Keep studying and don't build yourself a green. My name is Nate, I'm also a Biology major here at Augusta State, and um, just to, I guess, to go on your point, sorry, urban ecology, my professor here, Dr. Ware, teaches a great urban ecology class. It's her first semester teaching it. I've learned a lot about the heat island effect and um, near escaping, uh, all sorts of urban conservation for water. Um, San Antonio, I heard this program on NPR a couple months ago, they implemented. Um, a few uh, water conservation programs, including uh, rebates for dairy escaping water. Uh, if you implement these certain um, water conservation irrigation systems, you got a rebate. If you put in a dual flush toilet in your house, uh, you got a rebate. Um, is that something that you guys see, you know, in, in different cities from Chattanooga to, to Maryland, um, Southern Georgia, and even here in Augusta? Is that something that communities and municipalities will adopt? Um, or is that something that's kind of like, hey, um, if it's there, it's there. But I, I would see it as, you know, if, if we have these tenants, these rebates, that you're going to get money back if you implement this technology. Do you guys see that as, as our future? Yes, definitely. I, I, I mentioned that China was the once the dirtiest city in America, and now we're proud to be one of the cleanest and greenest. And uh, we have adopted what we consider to be state of the art directions that are uh, showing results. We're not uh, going off in all directions on this, but we have green roofs. We have green roofs on the council building, which you can see from City Hall. Just to demonstrate to people, we have green roofs that you can look down on from our walking. Uh, we have encouraged the use of, of white roofs for the very reason that it reduces the energy demand. And energy demands uh, are important to the individual because it reduces their need for air conditioning less. And so it reduces their cost. It reduces our need to reduce that energy in the first place. Uh, so we're employing all of these technologies. And I mentioned we were having dinner last night talking about smart water, which is the really a tough thing to deal with because it, it's so easy for people to dismiss it and think, well, you know, it's raining forever, it falls on the street, it falls on the sidewalks and all that. You know, what's, what's the big problem? They don't see the chemicals, the, the oil, things of that nature, the washing, washing into the ditches, eventually going into the rivers and not being treated. So, many years ago, Chattanooga adopted stormwater utility, and that was rather dramatic. Um, we were pushed back to where the amount that we were able to charge that it was really very low, so we were able to get it established. And so just in the last three years in uh, applying for an update of our municipal permit, which you mentioned earlier, uh, the permit that you have to have if you're a, 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 a community that's managing the stormwater and cities like that. We dramatically improved that whole utility idea. Uh, everyone pays that concept. Now, we've had a battle. Even you know, the federal government mandates these things. And one problem we had was that the federal government was then opting out to pay for the stormwater fees that the city was imposing, mostly these federal mandates, and these are required by the goal of 
conservation ethics. We put it in the water catchment system. Um, first, I start with 50 gallon field, and then in my house, I put it in 850 gallon water catchment. They corrugated, beautiful thing. Uh, and people really don't know what's doing there in the of Georgia, but you know, whatever. This is the way they do the greeters. Uh, <laughs> But, 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 you know, when you just ordered another one for another school, a thousand gallons of water catchment, and knowing about stormwater issues, the condition of stormwater is complete. Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't mind being wrong. But if you're looking at the time and velocity scenario, you've got peaks and a rain event, a five minute peak of that rain event, the majority of the water is coming down very rapidly. When it hits the, you know, the ground before it, that water sits, spills, Saturated down. What's in the basement? It's running off as fast as water can run. And it's collecting all of those other different types of chemicals. And then what happens is once that water gets concentrated in the piping system of a major city, then you've got these release points where you've got massive velocity of water entering into a, a, a riparian zone, denuding it of native plants, native habitats, the skies can come in and take over, and, and essentially ruining the hydrology of that stream. And so, you know, I have a thousand gallon, eight hundred and fifty gallon water catch in my house. Uh, when we run out, when the water stops, the power can get water. I mean, we have water all the time. And uh, when the guys run over our thing that stops the water coming to our house, we still have water because we got right there. The problem with Cairo, Georgia, is that we can't use that water for our flush our toilet. And that, that seems like a no brainer, but, but there are legal requirements. We're told by the planner that we have to build two sets of so, so I put the, the, the water testing in and I was like, okay, we're ready to go. And I know you got to put that in the septic tank and the other in the septic tank. And you can pump out the septic tank. And there are little, little quirks like that that need to be worked out. Metropolitan areas can do that. You know, I, I, when I studied in graduate school, I went out to, uh, if you want to know the coolest stormwater city in the nation, it's Fort Worth. Now, they were, I don't know if they still are, but it was cool. I actually flew out there. Uh, when those ideas take off, uh, they're really significant. The water catchment down here in the south can really take off. And, and what's happening is not only are you catching water for later use, you're catching it at those pulses of the storm that could potentially reduce the velocity of the mass that's going into our aquatic watershed. And so, hypothetically, that could be a great solution. Yeah. I'm getting the eyeball. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Sean Rosie, I'm from the Southeastern Natural Sciences Academy here in Augusta. I just want to say I've enjoyed so much listening to everything you've gone on so far uh, to present this interesting meeting. Um, I have just a couple of thoughts that I wanted to share that I feel like kind of synthesize some of the thoughts that have gone on uh, this morning. Um, we've had a lot of
more level of depth of monitoring and analysis of data uh, for a particular area in a localized way, we can significantly increase the amount of money we have to spend um, versus paying for the big paintbrush for solutions over a broad period. Yeah. Well, that's a great summary. Can I have one
this all. When you look at the NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, when you look at the NISCO, the National Park Preservation Act, when you look at the Clean Water Act, it, it's designed for the same issues in the same manner for every situation in every community. And we realize, those of us who are on the ground, whether you're in private industry, whether you're in academia, or when you're uh, in private business, or whether you're in local government, or whatever, that each situation is different. I asked a, a friend of mine who's very much engaged in, in water issues at the national level. And when the economy tanked in 2008, and local communities uh, were hit financially in a very hard way, just as the, the uh, uh, private sector was hit, uh, how many waivers did EPA offer these communities for immediate compliance with the Clean Water Act? to take the pressure off their local government economy. And he said, Mayor, none were issued. But since the economy tanked in 2008, EPA has engaged in over 500 consent orders and consent actions. So the pressure is still there to do the work. It's the flexibility, the flexibility that the private sector can take to affect public policy that's going to pay benefits for all of us. And I think that if there's one thing that we can do is to take that message to the people who write the policy and say, you know, let's not use cookie cutters when we write public policy. Let's look at individual situations and how can we use the resources of whatever government at whatever level to help local communities and local governments and local businesses to solve their problems. Let's turn the entrepreneurs loose and uh, make sure they pass. Uh, you can continue to follow the work of the partnership on our website, you've seen up here. And uh, they'll be posting uh, the papers that we submit to mission. There are uh, excerpts from our round table that will be posted there. So uh, please take a look at those and feel free to uh, to share those uh, and share that information as well. Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank ASU for hosting this. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you all very much for participating. We really appreciate it. We're going to hold, uh, hang up now. Thank you. Bye-bye.